Welcome to the Directions Mag Geo Inspirations podcast series with Joseph Kursky. Well, greetings, folks. Welcome to another installment of the Geo Inspirations column from Directions Magazine. Joseph Kursky here with you, your host. I'm extremely happy today because I've got Denise Powell with me, lecturer at the University of Colorado Atlas program. Welcome, Denise. Thank you for having me. Oh, much appreciated. I know you're just wrapping up your semester and super busy, so thanks for joining us. Yes, I'm so glad to be here. Can you describe for the listeners a bit about your current position at the Atlas program and also what the Atlas program is? And then later on, I'm going to ask you how you journeyed into that position. Sure, of course. Um, As you mentioned, I'm currently a lecturer at the University of Colorado and the Atlas Institute. ATLAS stands for the Alliance for Technology, Learning, and Society. And right now I'm currently teaching students pursuing a master's degree in technology for social impact, which focuses on leveraging technology, specifically information and communication technologies to help improve people's lives in mainly underrepresented communities, both in the US and abroad. And I graduated with my master's from this program in 2018 and came back in to teach this kind of a core course called case studies for the last two years. Oh, that's wonderful. And one of the reasons why I wanted you to be on this program is because in my travels to different campuses, I'm always looking for really innovative, you know, forward thinking, cross-disciplinary, crossing the traditional departmental lines programs and institutes. And I think Atlas is the perfect example for what universities really need to be doing. So I I salute you. Thank you so much. (laughs) Really, it is one of the best programs. And it happens just for the listeners uh, sake, it happens to be very close in proximity to me. So I'm actually able to visit there when Denise invites me at least once a semester. So Denise, can you unpack that a little bit? What, sure. what are your goals? What kinds of students do you have in the program and that sort of thing? Sure. Well, I'm currently teaching master's students. So they are enrolled in one of the two master's tracks. Um, so there are, uh, there's technology for social impact, which is where I teach. And then there's creative technologies. So those are the two master's tracks within Atlas. So creative technology sort of focuses more on a mix of art and design and creativity with technology. And then the social impact track looks at um, sort of examples of what researchers and professionals are doing in the field to sort of execute on a mission of improving people's lives through technology. And we also look at, in the the social impact part of it, we examine sort of what may help or hinder progress in a certain community. Um, Students that are taking my course learn to determine the appropriateness of a technology solution, mainly first by looking at cultural and societal needs mm-hmm. and often designing user-centered solutions alongside that community. So that's a very important aspect of the social impact master's track. Atlas also has a fairly large um, undergraduate program now. It's called TAM, um, Technology, Arts, and Media. And right now I believe they're up to about 280 students and they've grown significantly since 2015. So it's a fast, fast growing program. All of the different tracks are. And Atlas is, is, a, is a really unique program. Um, they attract students from many different backgrounds. Not all of them have a technology, uh, I should say technology proficiency. Mm-hmm. A lot of them come from an arts and design background. Some are like me who come from more of a humanities slash social impact or nonprofit background. So it really is very unique in it that attracts all kinds of people who are there to express themselves creatively, uh, learn about the world, and also learn how technology can help support in whatever mission that they are undertaking. Indeed, 280 undergraduates. I had no idea it was that large. I mostly have interacted with your graduate students. How many graduate students are in the program? So right now, and don't quote me on this, I I may be a little off with my numbers, but um, I believe the Creative Technologies program has around 30, uh, 20 to 30, and I I believe the Social Impact track has around 15 to 20. 
And, you know, every year we keep getting more and more applications. And so um, both tracks are growing. That is wonderful. Well, congratulations. And having gone through the program yourself probably gives you a, a whole set of additional insights that a standard, you know, if there is such a thing in Atlas, there probably isn't, but a standard instructor coming in from the outside, perhaps the outside of the university that actually hasn't gone through the program. What impact is, um, obviously, you, you were very attracted to the program and wanted to stay on after you graduated as an instructor. That must be, that must be rewarding, but it also must give you a certain insight as to maybe where to take the program in the future, having gone through it as a student. Yes, I would say that's definitely true. Um, when I went through this program, the case studies course that I'm cur currently teaching was very different than it is now. We didn't have sort of this professional development component to it. And it's, it's a little difficult because technology for social impact, or as we call it ICTD, which is Information and Communication Technology for Development, a very long acronym, um, it's a little mm -hmm. bit hard to describe. So one of the things when I came on board, one of the things I really wanted to focus on was this professional development piece. And I will say that the creative technologies um, course that is sort of a parallel course to this case studies class in the social impact track, they're similar. So the creative technologies track has a pro seminar uh, series where they also have professionals, researchers, people working for NGOs, people like you working for ESRI, um, private companies, startups, uh, people coming in talking about what they're doing in the field professionally. So it really gives the students a really good idea of the different opportunities that are out there in this field. And also it's, it's really neat because we have people um, who come in who are professionals who don't necessarily have a tech background, but they're working in technology. And they have a very, very deep understanding of technology. And we also have people such as yourself who have a very deep understanding of technology and can come in and give great demonstrations and workshops and really get our students who might not have that background really up to snuff on some of these new technological tools that are out there. So I would say that that, that is new. Um, we didn't have that professional development component to the course before where we've gotten guest speakers in. So it, it's, a, it's a new thing and it's been really successful. Well, I salute you for nudging the program forward in many ways. It, it, and I also appreciate your including, not just me, but geotechnologies in the mix, because I do think that it has lots of connections to what you were talking about. Most of the, not all, many of the listeners to Geo Inspirations know about Directions Magazine. That's where they come to come into the um, Geo Inspirations column in it. And Directions Magazine is really focused on geotechnologies. Many people in geotechnologies, with, with very few exceptions really, they're very passionate about the planet and about helping people. And so that's where I think there's a lot of shared values between Atlas and people in the geotechnology world. Yeah, they're pretty geeky, you know, the geotechnology people. Um, you know, they love maps and spatial data and, you know, as we talked about when I visited your class. But also there's this underlying, the reason why we're enthused about these tools and about these data sets is really because they allow us to share information, communicate about it, and solve problems on our planet. You know, biodiversity loss and climate and population change and energy, water, I mean, you name it social inequality. There's so many things that um, I think are at the forefront of the people in that field, and not just in that field, of course, but I think that that's a great mix to have the students um, uh, just to at least dip a few toes into the waters of while they're in your program, because as they go forward, making a positive difference on the planet with technology and design and, and their, their own you know, critical and spatial thinking, they can consider, oh, I don't have to be a full-time GIS analyst to use these tools, which was the central message that uh, we talked about when I visited your class a couple weeks ago. Yes, exactly. I think you're really onto something there. And uh, the reason that I invited you in to talk about GIS is because I think it's a really important tool for making a positive difference. How can somebody going through, through a program like this really understand the world wholly without understanding 
location and how people are impacted by mm -hmm. their place and their time. And, and I think that it's some of the tools that you showed us were incredibly helpful. Like I really like ArcGIS and I've used it in the past. And so when we were putting together this course, I thought of you and obviously had a connection to you through my husband, Ryan, who worked for Wiley Publishers as a geography and geography mm -hmm. editor. I thought that you'd be a perfect fit. And it turns out that after your talk, a couple of my students are very interested in pursuing GIS and um, they're, they happen to be taking another course next semester in GIS. So that was really exciting. Well, I was very impressed by you and your students. Every one of your students actually either emailed me or linked in with me, uh, you know, afterwards, which was really rewarding. It, 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 you know, oftentimes, as you know, from being an instructor as well, you don't necessarily see the sort of seeds you're planting. And I'm hoping that they and others in the Atlas program, yeah, consider, yeah, the where question is important. And that is a, uh, as you well said, an important mechanism for understanding our increasingly interconnected, complex world. And it's also always been this, as you said, this holistic understanding because it's actually ground in geography, mm -hmm. uh, grounded in geography. And so, and, and other spatial sciences, earth science, enviro, et cetera. Also, I think what's What's great about your program is that oftentimes people, oh gosh, how should I say this? They, they think I've got to be fully immersed in technology and technology does not allow me to do any sort of, you know, tap into my creative side of my brain, right? Mm -hmm. It's all uh, positivistic kinds of, you know, I'm running a buffer on this layer and I'm computing the riparian zone and, you know, and I'm computing the median age of these census tracts or whatever it is. But over the last few years, especially with the advent of of the cloud-based GIS like we talked about and the advent of things like story maps and other ways that you can incorporate multimedia into your analysis and also your presentation, your communication about the problem or issue you're trying to solve. It's, it's attracted a lot more of those design, art, you know, sociologists, others in different disciplines that we've never really had in the field before. And it's, it's really, I think, quite exciting. It's very exciting and sort of along those lines, I think it's really interesting when you combine sort of more technological or STEM based fields with art and social sciences, because mm -hmm. I think that it really deepens um, the, the field of STEM in general. And to your point, it also attracts people who wouldn't necessarily be attracted to STEM or perhaps they think that they're not good at science or they don't know math very well. Mm -hmm. And they don't consider, consider themselves to be strong in those subject areas, so they shy away from STEM. But when you make it more inclusive, like the Atlas Institute does, um, it really does change the way that things look and the way that people collaborate within the department. And it really deepens and makes the whole community a lot richer um, when you have people from different backgrounds. And I think in general, it really does make people more um, sort of interested in joining this group. Surprisingly, you know, I, I always think of, of uh, young girls and women here as um, the type that tend to shy away from STEM fields. And what's interesting about Atlas is that it's about, I think the student body is about 50% women, which is pretty remarkable for an engineering department. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. I think that bringing in these different subject areas and, mm -hmm. and making sort of these personally meaningful, like ma making the subject area per personally meaningful, where you know, you, you're, you're including art, you're including social sciences, it really does just deepen, deepen the whole community. Uh, exactly, and there are two things that come to mind. One, if we're gonna solve these vexing complex issues, right, we need exactly what you're saying, we need a great diversity of backgrounds and disciplines represented and people that are also being are who are willing to go outside of their disciplinary comfort zone right and and branch out into thinking in different ways about these problems yeah in my in my way of thinking it's it that's the only way we're going to get a handle on 
the complex issues of our planet is, is exactly the kinds of students that become decision makers through programs like yours. Exactly. And I think that um, GIS really comes into play there too, because it's very visual. And I think that it attracts a certain type of learner. Um, and I think in the STEM field, sometimes you don't always have the visual learner. And it just, I think that it's very attractive in that way, because it gives you that visual perspective and these really great tools to help explain data and explain what you're looking at. And oh, here's why, here's what we should look at in this particular region to help solve this problem. Um, so I think it's a really useful tool. Indeed, and even on your campus and many other campuses, but I'll just take yours as an example, you have things happening now that did not happen five years ago. For example, just two examples, um, and then one from a different university. But on your campus, you've got your Master's of the Environment program. So it's mm -hmm. a very intense, you know, year and a half, get my applied master's degree. Those students are using geotechnologies because they know that, well, A, a practical standpoint, it's going to help them get their job at the EPA or the Department of Natural Resources or the Nature Conservancy or wherever they want to work. They know it's an important tool. But B, it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier. It allows them to think spatially and critically. And it's not like X years ago <laughs> when it was, hey, Denise, do you want to learn GIS? Here's a bunch of manuals and we'll go see you. We'll talk to you in a couple years after you learn this. And then, you know, then you can resume right. your career. You had to almost put your regular career on hold to be, to know about GIS because it was just so, so cumbersome and difficult. I mean, because of a variety of reasons, but I'm not saying that nowadays it is push button and I get all my answers. I mean, it's still important that you, you're using your brain as the primary tool, <laughs> not, mm -hmm. the, not the software, but it has become a lot more approachable and it, it, it's manifested in programs like yours, the Master of the Environment. And then another one that I wanted to mention is the um, Earth Data Lab. So you know how universities are starting to say, hey, we need data science. Well, one could argue that programs like yours and geography and earth science have always been about data science. And so in some, in some ways, it's sort of a recrafting and a rebranding, which is, you know, it's a competitive environment. I totally get that. But the neat thing about uh, the University of Colorado's data science program, it's earth data science, which to me as a, as a geoscience person, that just kind of warms the heartstrings. You know, that's just a, a focus there of the data science program looking at uh, energy, water, hazards, et cetera. And then the last thing that I think is important is, is, is you're blazing these trails is there's an emerging community around geo design, you know, so sort of a landscape architecture plus geography plus GIS plus um, uh, urban studies or city planning. And that's taken root even in some universities where they have masters in uh, geo design they have certificate programs in a few not a lot of places but some places and it's very encouraging because again it's 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 like your program thinking in new ways to solve uh for example how we're going to create sustainable cities of the future etc yes and i really like the fact that what you're talking about is that you know, GIS is really being integrated in many different departments, uh, especially, you know, I can speak to CU's campus, um, that it's not only limited to the geography department, that you're seeing it elsewhere. And I think that's a testament to the field because it, it really is a valuable tool in so many different ways and can be used in, in these different departments as tools to help, you know, educate people on how to use technology, how to learn about maps, how to how to do all these different things that's just so important to an education and an understanding of the world in general. Indeed, and I'm not sure how much metrics you generate from your program. I know it's still relatively new in terms of, you know, academia, but um, it would be great, it would be grand sometime to to talk with you more about, okay, wh when students graduate from your program, where are they now? You know, where are the uh, nonprofits and government agencies, you know, private companies, et cetera. I, I, I just, even without that report, you know, right at my fingertips, um, and I know you've got a, a website that the, the viewers can, the listeners here can, can go to the Atlas program. You're, Denise is going to share some, some URLs with us, but I just have full confidence that those students are going to be making, those graduates are going to be making, uh, you know, smart, you know, informed decisions data-driven decisions, right, as they say, um, but also using their um, critical, 
perspectives, their thoughtful perspectives on, as you were circling around to before, using technology in meaningful ways to make smarter decisions. Mm -hmm. And and I just love that about about your program. Now, how did you journey into Atlas? Did you start there as a graduate student when it was first starting? And where did you say you you came from? A um, on the on the de, was it the design side of things, at humanities, etc. How did yes. you get into Atlas? Yes. So it's, uh, I'm kind of a hybrid professional, I should say. I've uh, had a lot of, a few different career paths that have led me to where I am now. Um, I started off in publishing. Um, I worked for Wiley Publishers in New York City um, as an editorial assistant for the Geography and Geology program. I went into publishing originally because I was a photojournalism and English major in college. I went to the University of ah, Iowa and ooh, got my undergraduate degree yep. there. And I've always loved to write. I'm a poet. Um, I ended up taking every single creative writing class there was. I was an editor for um, the University Review. And so that piqued my interest in publishing. And I've always really loved to travel. And so when the job came up in New York, um, I knew I wanted to live in a city. I knew I wanted to live in New York City. And when this job came up at Wiley, under the geography and geology, higher education in that realm. I was really excited because I just love maps. I love to travel. And I got to know so many great people um, in the field. And that really uh, sort of piqued my interest in general in, in traveling and just learning more about the world. And from then, I, re I really vowed that I was going to travel more. So I took a, I took a little hiatus uh, from publishing and ended up going into the health and wellness field for a short time. Um, and then I ended up, it was, it's a tricky to stay in that world for too long because your hands start to go. And I was a massage therapist and I was a, a oh. nutrition, nutrition mm -hmm. coach for a while because I, I'm really passionate about um, mindfulness and making sure people feel good. Um, so I, that has continued to sort of carry through my life. But when my husband and I decided we were going to take a hiatus from New York, we traveled for a year abroad and uh, we ended up working in Ghana for an organization. It was an NGO called O Africa, and they advocate for orphans and vulnerable children, keeping them in safe families as, as opposed to institutions. And so we did a lot of work on the ground there um, with the founder, but we also built a geography lab while we were there. We got donations from National Geographic and uh, built from the ground up a little kind of mud hut on the O Africa campus, and it was a geography lab. It was really wonderful. We populated. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, with uh, National Geographic maps, we had um, at the time it was 2008, and we had brought over a one laptop per child. So we had a laptop, and we had um, a Polaroid camera and a GPS unit, and we would send some of the students out to take Polaroid pictures of certain coordinates and then they'd write the coordinates on the side of the Polaroid. And they would come back and then we'd look at the map of Ghana and see where they were. And it was really just fascinating to see, just see their eyes light up when they looked at a map and when they interacted with, with you know, the GPS unit. And just, it was, you could just see the learning taking place and it was so amazing because a lot of these students hadn't really traveled much outside their village. Um, so they were getting this, this exposure to geography that they hadn't had before. Um, so that was really inspiring. And um, after that, I, we returned back to the United States and I ended up staying on board with that organization, O Africa, and I ran their US fundraising office from Colorado. And mm -hmm. I did that for about a year. Um, and just that work in general made me want to go into social impact work. And I knew I wasn't done with my education. I really wanted to get a master's degree. University of Colorado Boulder is right down the street. And so I was looking at different programs. Um, I actually run a online literary journal called The Voices Project. And I was at CU Boulder for a volunteer resource center event where I had a little booth and I was Kind of promoting the voices project and there was this woman next to me who was in the atlas program and she was in the program that i ended up joining and i talked with her about it and it just sounded right up my alley 
And I ended up waiting a bit before I applied, but I ended up going into that program, mainly because of our conversation that I had with this woman. Ah, uh, that, is, that is just grand, Denise. I, <laughs> there's so many good things that have come out of that. Hey, first of all, uh, go Hawkeyes, um, beautiful <laughs> campus there. Uh, go Buffs, uh, love see you Boulder. And, you know, I, again, I, I'd love to get your perspective at some point here in the next few moments, if you could, of as I, and not just me, but others travel around to different campuses and encouraging people to start the kinds of program, well, the kind of program that you've done. Now, I know that um, each, each one of those manifestations of the kinds of things that you've built are, are unique, and rightly so. Each campus would bring a certain perspective to it, but how did you how did you all at CU Boulder start something like that? Because I can imagine um, it was a lot of pounding of the, you know, knocking all the doors, pounding the pavement, you know, tapping on windows saying, hey, we're going to start this interdisciplinary program that's part of it's It's engineering and it's science, but it's also creativity. It's design. It's, you know, it's, it's social impact. It's the social impacts of technology and, and so on. How, how did all that uh, come about? That's a very good question. Um, one that I'm not 100% sure about, but um, the Technology for Social Impact track was founded by a woman named Revy Sterling. Mm -hmm. And she was, was a professor at CU. She has since left and now she's working for USAID. But the, so, the Tech for Social Impact program was kind of her baby. And she started that from the ground up, I want to say around eight or nine years ago. And the Atlas Institute itself is relatively new as well. I, I don't know exactly the year that it was founded. Um, I want to say 2012, but I, I could be wrong. Um, and I'm not, I, I really don't know who founded it or how. Um, but I can tell you that it does operate kind of on it, its, its own little entity on the campus. And mainly... CU kind of leaves Atlas alone because it's, it's small enough that, you know, we can kind of operate on our own accord and do different things uh, separate from the university. And we kind of make up our own rules and people leave us alone because we're just, Shh, don't tell, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I love that. Well, it's not so small though. I know some uh, departments that are way, way smaller than yours. And, you know, with over 300 undergrads and grads, that's, that's really something to be proud of. Not that, not that bigger is always better, but, but that is really interesting that you, that you've kind of, bla you're, you're doing some trailblazing there and yeah. you're allowed to be innovative by the, uh, the, the administration at the university, but I'm sure they're very proud of what you're doing. Um, now, I have met Mark Gross. Isn't he the director? He is the current director. Mark yeah, Gross is I met director. him. We were both at a, just because so many of us are, we love teaching and learning. We love the meaningful infusion of, of technology in it, all levels of education. I was over at a school district not too far from you, Oh, gosh, this was back in like, yeah, right around 2012, 2013, uh, St. Vrain School District, their innovation lab. So they had an, a big open house about, look what we're doing with technology, and but it's not just technology for technology's sake. We've got GIS. We've got people taking apart computers and figuring out how they work. They're going to be systems architects. Uh, we've also got this, uh, you know, design lab, et cetera. So anyway, in this big open house one evening, he and I were both there speaking about our respective, you know, perspectives that we brought to it. And I was just very impressed. And ever since then, I've I've kept in touch with him, and that's that's part of what keeps me coming back to the Atlas Institute is is it kind of like you were talking about with that person that shared her passion for the program. I just really got this sense from Mark way back when that this is really something special. This is not something to take for granted, and certainly not very many universities have exactly what you've got there. So again, uh, I like what you're saying about the power of one person's testimony that can attract a person to a program. And I just encourage all the listeners, you know, have your your elevator speech, your stairwell speech, whatever you want to call it, right? When someone says, hey, why are you passionate about what you're doing? And what are you doing? And be prepared to give that, right? Because you never know what kind of seeds you could plant in that listener's mind. Exactly. I, I really, I agree with you there. I It was very powerful to hear what the Atlas Institute was doing when I became interested in the program. 
And it really was that personal testimony that, that made me look into it. It made me dig a little bit deeper. And you never know the conversations that you're going to have with people and what interests they have. And I mean, you never know when you're, when you might actually really make that, that important connection. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a sense before we go into a, a bit more of your own advice, the kinds of courses that are offered in the Atlas program, just to get the listener a sense of these are the, the breadth and the depth that of what happens there. And again, just encouraging people to say, hey, if, if you don't have a course like this at your university or your community college or something like that, you might want to maybe encourage uh, that to be started because certainly um, as uh, we go, you know, ever so deeper into the 21st century, I, I think, and we're all trying to, you know, uh, be lifelong learners here, right? And we're all trying to make our institutions as relevant as possible to meet people's needs. And just to, if you could list a few of those course names, I think that would be inspiring. Sure. Um, so the Creative Technologies track has a sort of creative technologies and design studio, which is a very interesting class. It sort of introduces you to um, different creative technologies like processing, which is a coding language for artists. We look at fabrication, 3D printing. Um, uh, they do some work with Arduino and uh, electronics. So uh, the class itself takes place in a hackerspace, which is a really creative and inspiring environment to be in where you could just play and tinker. Um, that's what I really love about that class. Um, we also focus on research methods. There's a research methods class that is more um, for the tech for social impact grad students um, to learn about, you know, qualitative and quantitative research methods, how to ask great questions to find out more information, how to get people involved uh, participatory design wise, like how do you get your end users involved. There are also um, wearable technology classes that are um, look very interesting. I've never taken one, um, but they, you know, work with LEDs and, and they do a lot of sewing and, and it's, it's literally wearable technologies. Um, I'm trying to think what else. We, we have other uh, classes in sort of more human-centered or user-centered design, designing for accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, those are just to name a few. We have, we have a few uh, machine learning classes, um, courses in AI and robotics. Um, there are also courses on you know, creativity, design, and learning. Uh, that's more sort of education focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but those are a few that I can think of. Oh, well, that's grand. And as we have briefly talked about this semester, the, the, another interesting thing about geotechnologies is that they are becoming more and more uh, connected to other trends in society and IT, namely um, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, um, citizen science, you know, other technological and social trends, which is another good thing because, again, it's not like this little niche thing that, oh, geotechnologies, yeah, you go into that and then you're going to be down the hall and to the right and you're going to be working in this, you know, sort of, <laughs> you know, this lab and you're not going to be talking with the other people in your organization. That is just not the case anymore. Um, sure. and, and on a related note, AI is just, has already started to, along with, uh, you know, real-time data feeds and the whole open data platforms and the, that sort of, thing, that is just radically transforming what people can do because we're, we're really at the point where, you know, we talked about big data earlier briefly, but, you know, with the, with the data coming in from small satellites, from UAVs, from real-time sensors in streams, wildfire perimeters, traffic gauging, you know, et cetera. We, we really have passed the point where we've got too much data for us uh, in terms of what we can comprehend from our own understanding uh, in, in the traditional GIS ways. So how can we use artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, augmented reality, et cetera, to help us understand uh, these vast volumes of data and make sense of it, again, to make a better world. 
So I think it's going to be as, as exciting as, you know, these sort of ties between geotech and um, the Atlas Institute and your goals and dreams and, and hopes. I think there'll be even more as the decade wears on. Certainly. Um, I have a very good friend of mine who actually works for the Earth Lab on CU's campus, and she is a PhD from Atlas. And she um, is using geotechnologies um, in combination with social media, and she has created an algorithm to help sift through social media feeds to help in disaster relief efforts. So she oh. kind, of, kind of filters out the noise, and then she kind of maps the perimeters and helps the uh, emergency response team get to the right place uh, much faster. I met with three of the faculty there. Leah Wasser, I know her, Lauren Herwehi, um, Dr. Palomino. Yes. And I'm not sure if any one of those is one of your colleagues, but uh, yeah, very inspiring people, again, like you, thinking outside the box, trying to innovate, uh, and, and bring people to the program, um, not to wave their own horn uh, or wave their own banner, but again, to make a positive impact. Definitely. I think another really interesting example is um, Digital, Digital Globe uh, used satellite imagery to help locate um, a slave boat in Southeast Asia. You know, in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. um, the fishing in, in the fishing industry, uh, it, slavery is a big problem. And so Digital Globe use some of their imagery to locate one of these slave boats and ended up freeing 2,000 people. That is, uh, that's one of my favorite examples yep. of, you know, kind of satellite imagery, geotechnology in, in um, helping and actually improve people's lives. In, in a very radical, concrete way. Speaking of digital globe and satellite imagery, one of the earlier geospatial movies that I would show is uh, the geospatial revolution. It's still around from Penn state, wonderful uh, videos. Um, but one of the most compelling stories from that was uh, about the Darfur uh, refugee camps in Sudan and how this organization w was looking at uh, digital globe satellite imagery and going to the governments over there and also to the UN saying, look, here's the before and after imagery. There were villages and now they are no more. So to say that there's no genocide occurring is false because look, here's the evidence. So it actually did uh, make a key, a key difference when, when global attention was directed there in large part because of, like you were saying, people actually analyzing uh, digital spatial data and then not just analyzing it for the sake of uh, gaining GIS skills, but actually, okay, what are we gonna do about this now that we know about it? Exactly, exactly. Another example too that I really like was one of the case studies that we read um, also has to do with satellite imagery but, uh, and slavery, but it was locating um, uh, brick kilns, which are um, generally housed slaves, um, I, I believe in, in Vietnam or, or somewhere in Southeast Asia. But in any case, they were using crowdsourcing to have people look at this data and actually uh, pick out the, the brick kilns. And then they were using machine learning to come in and kind of help train an algorithm to then identify these br uh, brick kilns a little bit faster. So it, kind of the combination there, it's, it's so interesting how, you know, this geospatial technology can be used and then um, how you can train these data sets to actually pick up on, pick up on these things that can help identify, you know, these, these terrible things that are happening. Uh, good point. And, you know, s s sobering reminder that, yeah, we've got a long way to go. We are, I think the, the awareness of key issues on our planet has at least in my career, has been, it, it, we're at an all-time high. People are actually aware of you know, water matters, uh, energy matters, uh, uh, biodiversity loss actually matters, uh, et cetera. But there are still a lot of trends and a lot of uh, things happening, as you referred to, that are just, that are just wrong. They're just going, the, the trends are going in the wrong direction. People are still treat, being treated um, horribly around the planet in various ways and in various places. So, yeah, what can we do in the time that we have been given here on the planet to make a positive difference? You know, that being said, um, you, you mentioned a bit about your pathway, which is much appreciated. 
Um, what are you proudest of being a part of? I know you've done a lot of varied things, which is very encouraging, I think, for the listener to hear. What, what stands out as a project that you're really proud of, of being involved with? Um, I would say, well, it's a couple things. I did a really interesting practicum project. I created a storyboard, like a storyboarding tool for kids because I'm really interested in youth education and mm -hmm. uh, creative expression and um, stories have always been such an integral part of my life as you know, a jour journalism major and an English major and somebody who loves to write and learn about the world and the human experience. Um, so I, I created this tool in one of my classes that ended up being a practicum project and it's called the telling board. And it has um, these little storyboarding panels um, on a single board, it's tactile. And um, kids can kind of move around these pre-illustrated cards um, that help guide a story because they contain all the um, different story elements like conflict resolution, plot setting. And then there's a recording mechanism on the bottom of the device that they can actually record their story. So it really gives kids mm -hmm. an opportunity to um, not only create a story that the, the way that they want to, but then also practice telling it and building confidence in using their voices. Um, and we had that user tested in CU's Department of uh, Speech, Language and Hearing, um, where kids were learning about the narrative process and kids who were having some trouble with that. Um, so it was really, really neat to see one of my prototypes being used in that department. And I had never prototyped before. Like I said, I came from a very, you know, sort of humanities background. And I was very proud of that project because um, not only did I get to kind of design it and then user test it, and it was more of an iterative process, which I really enjoyed, um, but I also uh, co-wrote a paper, an academic paper, which is one of my first ones. Um, and that got accepted to the Interaction Design and Children Conference, which I presented in Norway in June of 18. So I'm really proud of that project. It was sort of everything coming together for me at Atlas. Um, I would say that that's, that's one of them. I'm also really proud to be um, a board member on, um, for O Africa, the, the NGO that I had mentioned that I worked with. Mm -hmm. so I'm still heavily involved in that organization. And I've learned a lot about um, how you need to involve key stakeholders, government, um, and get, get a number of different people on board to help uh, support your cause um, to sort of move forward with your mission. And that's what OA does very well. Um, they really helped uh, sort of refine and shape, reshape uh, childcare reform in Ghana for the better um, to help uh, kind of move away from institutional care to uh, sort of family-based care for kids. And it's, it's really done a lot for the youth in Ghana. That indeed must be very rewarding. And I'm sure a ton of hard work. Uh, and, and what you're talking about there toward the end, how do you build that community? How do you advocate that what you're doing is important to build uh, some consensus to um, move the project forward. Uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that I don't know if we teach that very well. Uh, a lot of it sure is, is life experiences and on the job and so on. Um, but that's another reason why I, I think I'm attracted to your program is because you actually talk about those kinds of things. It's okay. You can have a great idea. But if you can't get anybody else excited about it, um, you know, that is going to be a significant challenge. And then also, how do you present your idea in various ways, in, in various forms? Who is your audience? And it, all those things you actually, you actually do um, in your courses. So again, um, I, I'm, I'm a great admirer. Um, Denise, just kind of uh, being sensitive to your time, do you have advice for people coming into, you know, they like technology, they like design, they want to make a difference on the planet. Um, maybe they're in STEM, maybe they've come into this from humanities like you or from geo and viro like me. What, what's your advice to those people? And maybe they're not, you know, 21 years old and an undergraduate. Maybe they're mid-career saying, you know, I, I really want to maybe shift gears a little bit or maybe draw on the things that I've done in the past and, and maybe... Uh, craft them into a new vision. What's your advice for those folks? 
My advice would be to uh, explore your ideas. Don't be afraid to explore your ideas and talk about your ideas and also test your ideas. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's important to keep moving um, and not necessarily be afraid that something might not work. I mean, I think that we need to rethink the way that we view failure in general, not only young people, but everybody. Um, I think that's why certain people kind of tend to shy away from STEM fields because they're afraid something's not going to work or they're not going to be good at it. Um, but I think coming into something like this or a program like this or trying out a new course or technology that you might not be familiar with is really beneficial. Um, and yeah, you might not get it right the first time, but you know, try out an idea if you have one. And I am a huge fan of the iterative design process. You know, design an idea, test mm -hmm. it, talk to people, um, make sure that you're getting people involved who are going to be your customers or people you're going to work with on a community level to help solve a problem. Um, either way, I think talking to as many people as you possibly can about um, what it is you're trying to do and understanding sort of the ethics behind why you're doing it and how do you protect the people involved. There are many different things to think about, but I think in general, having an idea, not being afraid to execute on it, not being afraid of constructive criticism or feedback, and using all of that mm -hmm. data, right, to, to make your idea better um, and not necessarily viewing it as, oh, that didn't work. But it's like, well, how can I improve this idea? Um, who can I talk to? Who is a smarter person than me? Um, surround yourself with smart people and get feedback and just keep moving. Uh, there's some gems there, Denise. Thanks for sharing. I feel very humbled by... The, in my own pathway of, you know, geotechnology, education, STEM, et cetera, uh, I have always been uh, in awe of the kinds of things that people around me are doing. And so I think your, your points are well taken. It's, you don't have to be the shiniest object. Uh, in fact, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in listening <laughs> and learning from your peers. And that's another thing that I like about this community that you and I are in, is STEM, education, you know, tech, is that uh, they're very willing to share their advice, their experience with, with others. You almost never meet anybody that's abrasive, that uh, won't share their information because they, they kind of want to step on other people to look good. You know, it's, that's just not part of the culture uh, in, the, in these fields. Um, and so I'm very, I'm, I'm very blessed to be in that, um, that community and certainly uh, have appreciated, you know, getting to know wonderful, inspiring people out there like you that are actually making a positive difference. Uh, Denise, what about this? What is your favorite book or resource that you'd like to share with the community here? Let's see, my favorite book. Well, this is... This I know is you're a poet. More, I know, this is kind of more personal. Like, my, my favorite... My favorite book is, it's a, it's a poetry book. It's Pablo Neruda's The Captain's Verses, which I've loved forever because it's just mm. beautiful. Um, I also love anything by E.B. White. Um, ah. Here's New York um, is one of my favorite books uh, just because I have such an affinity to New York and I, I lived there during probably the best part of my life. Um, hmm. In terms of other resources, I look on, um, every once in a while, I'm, I'm on USAID, um, sort of they have like a, a blog. I'll, I'll look at things now and again on USAID. Um, I really love Seth Godin. He is a kind of a marketing guru, but the way that he talks about um, ideas and projects and moving things ahead, um, and creativity in general. I really, really love his whole sort of philosophy. And he has a really great blog. It's, uh, again, it's Seth Godin. And I would highly recommend joining his blog. He just sends these little nuggets of information, little tidbits, thoughts. Um, every day mm -hmm. I, I read his blog. It just inspires me uh, just to keep moving forward and not give up. Oh, I love it. Um, and Again, folks that are listening, Denise has shared some URLs with us, so I encourage you to go look at those. Denise, knowing how busy you are, this has been really grand, 
And so thanks for the, the, the journey story that you've got, the, the description of the Atlas program, the other things that you've been doing in the past and in, at present. It's just, it's just been a, a joy to have you on here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, all best wishes to you in the future. I hope you have a personal and professional success and that um, I know you'll continue to, to make a positive difference on our planet. Thank you for everything you're doing as well, Joseph. Oh, Denise, thanks. It's a team effort. Much appreciated. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you.